Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the BPD Bravery Show. Today's guest is Keith Gaynor, a senior clinical psychologist in the Tech Early Intervention and Psychosis Service, Dublin, and an assistant professor in School of Psychology, University College in Dublin. He is an expert in psychosis. So um, I'm really excited to be talking to him today. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hi, and welcome to the BPD Bravery Show, where we discuss tips, strategies, struggles, triumphs, and success stories related to borderline personality disorder. Here is your host, Faye Green. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm excited that we finally made this. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's talk about psychosis. So when we talk about psychosis, what are we talking about? How would you so, describe it? So psychosis typically is where people hear or see something that isn't there. that Other people can't hear or see. Or they have a belief that other people don't believe, something unusual. So they might believe something, they might have a paranoid belief that the CIA is out to get them. Or a delusional belief that maybe that you know that they believe they're Jesus, or they believe they're somebody very special when they're just an ordinary person. And those kind of those are the core pictures of psychosis. And one of the things we know historically, we have this historical picture of psychosis that that was for mad people. That only happened in psychiatric hospitals. That was a really rare. And actually, that's not true. And there's been amazing research in the last 20 years, a lot of it happening in the States, where if you go out and you knock on people's doors and you interview 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 people, it turns out lots of people have these symptoms. They have them all of the time. And they just have them as little blips. And it doesn't interrupt their day. They have an unusual belief or an odd experience, or they hear something for a moment, or they see something for a moment, and they keep on going and they keep doing the washing up and they keep making the lunch for the kids and for some other people that becomes kind of it's kind of maybe a kind of permanent part of their life but it doesn't interfere with anything they're still a bank manager they're still driving the school bus you know they're still doing the school run everything's kind of normal and then for a very small group of people actually this becomes an illness and it becomes you know can become quite a significant illness and so that's the group that we kind of know from services but actually the much larger group is the people who've been experiencing this in the community and it's never interrupted their life at all. And so that out of the last kind of 20 years, this has moved from being the kind of illness of Shutter Island and Alfred Hitchcock and all the Hollywood movies to this idea that a, a Dutch researcher called the proneness persistence impairment model. Some people are prone. They'll get little flutters or little blips when they're stressed or tired or under pressure. For some people who persist, and it might be an important part of their lives, but actually doesn't dominate their lives and they're not distressed by it. And then for some people it's impairing. And that's what we call illness. And that's what needs intervention and, you know, and, and psychological help. And so we, in the last, really only the last 10 or 15 years, we have a fundamentally different idea of what psychosis was compared to the last hundred years. And now the question isn't what, what causes psychosis. Now the question is, what moves us from a blip to something that's permanent, or from something that's permanent to something that's distressing? And when we think about what makes it something permanent to something distressing, that's where BPD comes in. Because all of the underlying features of BPD are also some of the underlying features that make these things uh, distressing and that's why this is such an interesting show to do to talk about bpd and psychosis together because we very seldom get a chance to do that so people with bpd do have um psychosis can have can have psychosis. yeah so it's not unusual at all for somebody so that the history of bpd you know i'm sure loads of the listeners to the show know the history of that term bpd borderline personality disorder the borderline was meant to be the borderline between neurosis and psychosis. That this was a group of people that sometimes dipped into psychosis, but not permanently, and you know sometimes dipped into neurosis, anxiety, and depression. But they weren't permanently there either. They were somewhere in between. That was the B in BPD. But it is the psychosis, you know, teaching and literature and research went in a totally different direction from the BPD research. 
and psychosis became understood over the next 50 years to be a brain disorder and to be chemical and to be genetic. And we cut out all the kind of personality factors and all the psychological factors and all the emotional factors. And for people with BPD, all of those things got cut away. They said, oh, no, this is a personality disorder. It's an awful phrase, a really, a really a jarring phrase for me. You know, this is all about someone's personality. This isn't about what's going on inside. And actually, these two things are much closer together. That lots of people who have BPD will sometimes hear voices externally, outside their head, like they'll hear a voice on a phone. And it will be saying things, disparaging things often to them, distressing things often to them, that they would sometimes hear in their own mind. But occasionally they're going to hear it outside. And that's a, you know, it's a difficult experience to have. You know, we all sometimes think we're rubbish, but we don't actually want somebody outside it saying it to us or shouting it to us when we're walking down the streets. So it's a hard thing to hear. Or we might have a feeling of not trusting people, but to act to be actively paranoid, where we think the neighbours are plotting out, you know, plotting to get us, so we're frightened to leave the house. That's a difficult experience to have. And lots of people with BPD sometimes have those experiences. And there's lots of research now in the last 10 years, but only the last 10 years, that says, no, people with BPD are having these sometimes, and they really need to be taken seriously. And in the literature, sometimes you see it written, they're quasi-hallucinations. Actually, there's no evidence of that. People go, people are experiencing, if they describe hallucinations, they describe them very much like people with psychosis. And they can also experience paranoia, absolutely like people with psychosis. And so for people with BPD, there's something really important about understanding the symptoms of psychosis. And if they have them, and not everyone with BPD will, but if they do, that those things are taken seriously by their clinicians. And for people with psychosis, now what's emerging is the key between having this in the background and not impacting your life and having this as a, you know, a really difficult, distressing experience is all the things that came before. And that's often, if, if you look at the histories of someone with BPD and the history of someone with psychosis, their, their histories are identical. They had the same traumas. They had the same difficulties with attachment. They had the same difficult maybe family situations or the same stresses going up through their lives. And that's some of the part of the reason why people become paranoid, because there's a very good reason they become paranoid, because there was lots of history where actually they couldn't trust people or where they hear a voice that's saying something distressing to them. Well, they have experience of people saying distressing things to them. The same victimization that happened to people with BPD also happened to people with psychosis. And so there's a, a strong link in both groups of people, but they're kind of separated out. They're seen in different services, seen by different clinics, seen by different doctors in different hospitals. And actually for the group of people, no, lots of this is very similar, big overlaps, and we really need to talk about it and to understand it. I have a question. I want to go back on the term you use. Quasi hallucinations. Yeah. What is that? So well, quasi is where it's it's kind of understood as not quite real. So mm. we we a little talk before we were talking to the show before the show, we were talking about sometimes where we can hear a, a noise and we wonder, oh, is that really there? Or we can hear our name being called, you know, like, turn around. And that's a little quasi-hallucination. It, it is a hallucination. We're hearing something that's not quite real. But also, it's not. It's not a, you know, a permanent part of our experience. It's not happening regularly. It's not a, a part of our, our, our everyday lives. And so it, it's quasi. But if it becomes part of our regular lives, if it's something that we really... In, in impacting us, if we're thinking about it, responding to it, if, if you know, we're worrying about it, okay, then this is this is a, a real thing, and we need to take it seriously. And so, for someone who is, um, say, who has BPD but also has psychosis, or someone who has psychosis and also has who has mm -hmm. psychosis but has the symptoms of BPD as well, what would their ideal? Um, intervention what kind of therapy yeah. or therapeutic measures should they seek well i think we, we, we could reframe that a little bit which mm -hmm. is actually not starting with the diagnosis 
the treatment shouldn't match the diagnosis, the treatment should match the person. And so the question is, what would suit Faye? What would suit Keith? And so when you have a skilled clinician, a doctor or a psychologist, sit down and talk, it's talking to Faye, it's talking to Keith. And go, okay, what does Keith need? And it might turn out I also have an addiction issue, so I need to deal with the drink. You know, that's, that's you know, that might be the first thing on the plate. Or, you know, there's lots of cannabis being used. So lots of people I'd meet using too much cannabis. Lots of people in the PPD community using too much cannabis for their own good. Okay, actually, we need to do something about the cannabis before we can do anything else. So, okay, they might be saying that. Or they might be going, okay, no, this is about panic attacks. We need to address that. Or this is about, you know, anything else. We're matching all of the tools we have in terms of psychology and medication and social support to the person. And so we're not seeing the person as reduced down to a diagnosis. And so something like, you know, you know, the DSM well in the States, that's helpful because it gives us a shared language. We can talk about things, but it's not gospel. It's not how people are made. Any one of us can pick up the DSM and go, no, I could fit in that category, that category, that category, because we're a blend. Because we're people, we're complex. And, you know, we don't fall into one categorical box. There isn't one treatment that's going to work for us. And um, all the treatment trials back that up. So treat the human, treat the person themselves, not yeah. a diagnosis. Yeah. You mentioned DSM in the USA. Ireland doesn't have. Yeah, so uh, Europe ha has a different one. So uh, Europe, Europe has the ICD, and oh. they're very similar. Yeah, so so the World Health Organization has has the ICD um, eleven now. Um, so it's 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 the same. They're very equivalent. They change every couple of years. Some things get added. Some things get taken away. But it's the same idea that you're you're categorizing symptoms and illnesses. So what's there, uh, as far as um, a glimmer of hope, if someone has, um, say, they have BPD and they also experience psychosis or vice versa, they have psychosis and they also experience, uh, you know, some underlying symptoms of BPD. How could they so, look at it in a positive manner? Well, I think, you know, compared to the history of this, this is the most hopeful time in our entire history to be talking about mental health. There has ne We have never had more knowledge about mental health than we do now and it's never been less stigmatized and uh, i have enormous hope in i think you guys call them generation z but all the people who are in their teens and their 20s now they are the most aware clued in about their own well-being clued in about what their world and their environment is doing to them negatively mm -hmm. and positively um, and they are showing us the things that society should not be doing to people and they're putting their hands up and they're calling it out. That's absolutely phenomenal. And in a way, the previous generations kind of accepted it and said that this is the way it had to be. And so there's a huge hope that actually mental health for the first time is less stigmatized than it was. So I, I don't know if you guys have the phrase around the bend. You know, the, you know, some if they went nuts, they went around the bend. I, I don't know. Or, or, or have... around the twist. Is that, is that a colloquial phrase? For I have no idea, but I I don't know many yeah. phrases in English either, so <laughs> okay. don't take my word for it. It might be a, it might be a phrase. I just might not be aware of it. Yeah, in Ireland, that was you know it's an old fashioned phrase for you know like going mad or going crazy or any of these terrible oh. things. But what it meant, you know, what it came from was the asylum was always out of sight. It was down the end of the road and around the bend, behind the big trees. That's where the psychiatric asylum was. And so that's where people went if they had mental health problems. They went away oh. somewhere. And, if, you know, it would be the same in the States, but in Ireland, every big town has an asylum somewhere on the outskirts of whatever the original city was. And sometimes those are the suburbs now because the cities have grown, but that's where people were sent. And so when we're thinking about mental health now, now we're doing podcasts about it. Now, you know, mental health is, you know, it is everywhere. It's, you know, people are interested in college. People are talking about it, you know, as part of, you know, Congress, but people are running for Congress with the idea of improving mental health. So that's fundamentally different to even half a generation ago. So that's one really important reason to be hopeful. 
Second really important reason to be hopeful is there are now interventions, I think especially psychological interventions, that have provided really strong evidence-based treatments for both BPD and psychosis. And so lots of people with BPD will know DBT. DBT is relatively new. It's 25 years old. So in the history of mental health, that's new. And its evidence base is phenomenal. It's as good as anything that's out there. It won't work for everybody. There is nothing that works for everybody. We know, you know, because people are unique. But also we know this works really well. Schema therapy has a great uh, evidence base. Mentalization-based therapy has a great evidence base. It's the same with psychosis. Up until the mid-90s, there was a myth, and it was incorrect, that talking about your symptoms was damaging and shouldn't be done. And so psychosis was a medical condition that should be treated by hospital and, med uh, and medication. And so psychologists were actively kept away from the treatment of psychosis up until the mid-90s. And then you had a series of trials looking at cognitive behavioral therapy and psychosis. And it emerges that actually, you know, talking to people is a really good thing. People with psychosis are just people. And they may have some difficult symptoms sometimes, but actually they also need to talk. And some of those trials showed CBT to be really strong. But lots of the trials showed that actually the placebo intervention, which is talking to a skilled therapist, but not about, it was also really effective. It was much more effective than just treatment as usual, which is typically medication. And so actually the really obvious thing that any, you know, lay person on the street would think is actually you may need to talk to a psychologist if you have psychosis. You may have things you want to get off your chest. This mightn't be an easy experience for you. And so that is now a core part. So uh, you have in the States as well, but the NICE guidelines, which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, they, people, if, if they don't know it, should look it up, nice.org.uk. It compiles all the evidence for every disorder and it compiles all the evidence and says, okay, here's where the evidence is strong. Here's where the evidence is medium. Here's where the evidence is weak. Um, and it's, it's a free website. And I just wrote it down. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice.org.uk. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a UK based organization. And yeah. And so everyone can see. Okay. And they do nice kind of one pagers for everybody. But if you want to read the big 150 page reports, you know, they're in there too. And so there's evidence from all of these areas that are working for people with these conditions that, and those things didn't exist. That people are considered, you know, used word like untreatable, even kind of 25, 30 years ago. And I think the third bit to be really hopeful about is the whole movement towards youth mental health and early intervention. And this, you know, primarily came out of Melbourne, Australia, but it's now a worldwide phenomenon. And it's the idea that mental health is essentially mental health services are passive. So if you think about cancer services, we all get information to put on sun cream. We all get information to wear a hat on sunny days. You know, we're getting information the whole time about how to prevent cancer. And we get then if we go in with a little mole on our skin, our physician will, you know, check it out and, you know, get a biopsy. We'll get the earliest possible treatment for that. We're not waiting for stage four cancer. We're not waiting for the crisis. We're not waiting for people to collapse. The mental health services, often we're waiting for the crisis. The person has to go on and on and on. and They try to get through college. and It doesn't really work. They try to keep a job or keep the relationship going, but the partner leaves them. And it's only when they, they get fired or the partner leaves them or their parents, you know, are pulling out their hair that actually then they get to engage services. And uh, you know, we said before the show, that, you know, often people can be waiting years to get the right diagnosis, the right service, and then years to try and get on the right program. And the idea of early intervention is, no, let's try and organize our services so they intervene as early as possible, as young as possible. We know that mental health problems develop primarily between people who are 15 and 25. That's the core presentation time for all mental health problems. BPD, psychosis, anxiety, depression, addiction, all start there. We often think about someone with mental health problems as someone in their 40s or someone's, you know, you know, hit kind of rock bottom or whatever. That started 25 years earlier to hit rock bottom in their 40s because they started having these difficulties when they were 19, 18, you know, 13. 
And actually, that's let's move the services up there. And it's a core principle of all healthcare, but it's not a core principle of mental health care. But it can be, and you can move your services, move your education, move you know how services are structured, what referrals they're receiving, how are they paid for, so when people can access that when they're younger. Um, and that's I think I'm incredibly hopeful about that, and that's the area that I work in every day. I think it's an incredibly positive. Uh, developments in, in mental health. So there's hope. Yeah. There is yeah, overwhelming there is hope. hope. <laughs> That's overwhelming. good to hear because I remember even when I did my research, when I was diagnosed with BPD and I did research on it, hmm. it wasn't that long ago. It was in 2017. Um, a lot of the research, just there's no cure, there's no, you'll suffer you'll suffer from BPD for the rest of your life. You know, there, it was mm. even, you know, just Googling things. It seemed very bleak and, oh, did it get me down? I, I, as soon as I got, I felt so hopeless. That's it. There's no, there's no chance for me. Yeah. Right. And so now that there is hope out there, um, or you said early intervention, you know, can be great. I think it should be implemented everywhere. You don't hear about it much though. No, as it's, much. You don't hear about it in mental health, but you'll hear about it in every other aspect right. of your of your physical health. You know, it's and that's that's the kind of the still that stigma. Not not I think there's much less stigma in among people about mental health. I think we are talking more about it than we ever did. And uh, we have sports people coming forward, and we'll have you know celebrities coming forward, and they'll be talking about their bipolar or their depression. I think that's great. But, you know, people in the community will be talking about it much more. But when it comes to funding and structures and services, that's still part of the very traditional model. And lots of those myths about mental health not being treatable, that that's why those myths exist, is if you leave something untreated for 20 years, well, then it's difficult to treat. But actually, if you, you're talking to someone who's 17, and they still have all their options, and they still, you know, they, have, they haven't made all the mistakes, and, you know, things haven't gone as bad as they could go for them, then this is a really hopeful place to be. And that's that's why it's very nice work to do. You know, people often ask, you know, being a psychologist, is it a difficult job? It's a lovely job. Because, you know, no one comes in happy. But actually, by the end of the work, people are doing, off doing amazing things. Yeah, um, you see that. Yeah. Well, we see that all the time. So, you know, you, I mean, I'm doing this job 15 years. So, you know, you, you don't see it every week, but you see it over months and years. Um, and so you'll get emails back from people. And, you know, so I got an email maybe two weeks ago and it's someone I worked with in 2012. And, you know, you know things are going really well. Uh, still with still with that girlfriend I was with in 2012. And, you know, still do, you know, doing this job now. And, you know, that's great. And thanks very much. Wow, for complete, you know, back. They still keep up with you. No, I mean, I hadn't heard from this person in... In, in, I don't know, in ages, after, wow. uh, yeah, years. But they just dropped a line. It was incredibly sweet of them. They didn't have to, but you know, yeah, that's it's rewarding. Um, it's rewarding, <laughs> yeah. So it's a great job because there is so much hope and there is so much change because people are extraordinary. Remember who you're dealing with. You're not dealing with a diagnosis. You're dealing with a person. So it's not. We're not talking about BPD. We're talking about a person. People are extraordinary. So, you know, once you have hope and faith in people, then actually people go ahead and surprise you and do extraordinary things all the time. I love how you say it. You're not your diagnosis. No. You're not your diagnosis. You're, you're you. Yeah. Your diagnosis is just a crude way of describing some of the things that you feel inside sometimes. And so it's there so doctors can have a shared language. We know what we're talking. We're talking about the same thing. We're talking about something. But you know, when you talk about feeling, you know, very emotional, you know, what that feels like for you. You know, that <laughs> does the line in the DSM really capture that? You know, <laughs> it doesn't. That's not what it's like. When you feel joy, when you feel hope, when you you know, go out with your friends and you have an absolute blast. You know, all of that's happening for you. None of that's there. You know, when you look up seven or eight you know symptoms in a, yes, a diagnostic so. manual yeah it's grand it does its job but it, it, 
it doesn't really describe people. So don't take it too seriously. I mean, not professionals, but I'm saying yeah. um, <laughs> um, most of us humans just, just don't yeah. take it seriously. Um, it. Just go get the help you need. Try to knock down as many doors as you can to get what it is to get your help. Yeah. Um, I'm talking to myself. And, <laughs> yeah, and you will often know the help that you need. You will know, God, the thing I really need to work on is this. And it might line up with, you know, DBT or might line up with schema or might line up with CBT for psychosis or compassion focused therapy for psychosis. Or it might be something else. I don't know, actually, God, I just really want to work on self esteem. I really want to talk about some stuff. I really want, you know, I want to do relationships. This is a key part of my life and it's difficult for me and that's what I want to, you know, work on. So it's not just all hopeless, but there's a lot of hope out there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for it, giving me your time. Thank you so much for joining us on today's BPD Bravery Show. If you've enjoyed it, then like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure to tune into our show every Monday and Friday. And remember, you are so much more than your BPD.